Will you join, join with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Then we follow, Lord, we think through the songs that we have sung this morning. The direction that our hearts are, are directed towards the salvation of Jesus Christ. And of course, the communion table reminds that too. We're reminded that of the great work that you've done on our behalf. Of your grace. Of the life that was poured out for us. So that we might have a relationship. A unique relationship that's different than any other relationship that we have with children or, or husbands and wives, mothers and fathers, cousins and friends. We have a relationship because of what you've done with the almighty creator of the universe. With a God who saves. With a God who's, who does the impossible and that's the norm. Lord, we, ask, we want you to do the impossible in the lives around us. We ask you, Lord, that you would draw people to you, that we might be the instruments. And we feel that perhaps we are a little dull. We're not as sharp as perhaps we should be. But we want to rely completely on your strength, on your ability to change and motivate hearts. So in our workplaces and in our communities that we live, we ask, Lord, that you would provide opportunities for us to proclaim a witness the witness of how you changed each one of us we tend to be a little bit shy in this area Lord but we need boldness we don't feel that we will say the right things or we're afraid that we're going to say the wrong thing and it's going to cause somebody to go in the opposite direction but Lord we ask for your words to be in our mouths We also ask this morning, Lord, that you would watch over our, our missionaries who are around the world sharing the good news, encourage and strengthen them, and open our hearts to your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Inside your bulletin, there's a, there's a sermon outline. Please take that out. There's a few fill-ins for you. All you need is a pen or a pencil. On June 4th, 1940, following the evacuation of the British and French armies from Dunkirk, a German tsunami had covered the continent of Europe. A short, fat, balding man gave an address to the House of Commons in England. He said, we shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight in the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the land, landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Churchill's England was losing the war. The nation that once boasted that the sun never set on the British Empire now faced the real possibility of complete annihilation. And yet, one must have courage in the face of certain doom. Churchill was that man for England. You see, the approachment of death can bring a certain clarity to mind of one who's about to die. That courage causes a person or may cause a person to have courage to believe. The courage to deny a crowd. The courage to admit one's sin. A courage to acknowledge one's need. And in our text this morning, our attention is drawn to the thief's courage to believe. And yet the backdrop to Luke 23 takes, play, takes us back not to Calvary at the moment, but pulls us clear back to a prison. Three men were awaiting execution. The gospel, record, the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all record for us that these were thieves. But these were no petty criminals. These men were not 
arrested for lifting your wallet or taking your watch or breaking into your home when you are gone on Christmas and stealing your Christmas tree. You see, these men were insurrectionists. They were murderers. They were the type of thieves who robbed in broad daylight with the proverbial gun. And if you said, no, I will not give you, they just took your life and then took your, your things anyway. You see, one of these notorious thieves was Barabbas. The others were his accomplices. You see, word had reached the prison cell that Barabbas was to be set free. And these two thieves joined a third individual on the street that could hardly walk. And as they proceeded down the street, the centurion marched before them, announcing to the entire world, to the streets that were filled in Jerusalem because the Passover had come, announcing what their crimes were. Thieves, murderers, and Christ was in between both of them. On the right and on the left, these thieves hung on the cross. And the entire time this was taking place, the anger of the victims was not focused towards these thieves of what they have done. The crowd's hostility was focused upon the man in the middle. They began to mock him, ridicule him, tease him. Because he had proclaimed to do something that was just so horrific. He proclaimed to be someone that just seemed to be an impossibility. He proclaimed to be the Son of God. He proclaimed to be the incarnate Christ. And for that, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin could not allow this man to live. On trumped up charges, he was portrayed, he was carried before all the leaders from Herod to Pilate to the Jewish, Jewish leaders. And they all said, he's guilty. And yet even Pilate on that day tried to find a way as he looked at this individual, this Jesus, and said, there's no reason for you to die. Decide to leave it in the hands of the people. He said, look, it's my custom during the feast to allow one individual to go free. I'll make it easy. The notorious Barabbas, who is a murderer, who is a thief, who is a criminal, who's deserving of death, or this guy, Jesus. Who do you choose? And the spiritual leaders of that day encouraged the mob, the crowd. Give us Barabbas! We want Barabbas! Well, what am I to do with this Jesus? Crucify him! Crucify him! That chant continued on. Again, as they're sitting on the cross, hanging on the cross, the two thieves began to follow in with the crowd. Both Mark and Matthew proclaimed that the thieves were again mocking him. With an arm's reach, they began to cry out and, say, and, and mock the Son of God. It takes courage to deny a crowd. It takes courage courage to stand out of a crowd who is moving in one direction with a large flow of people and to say, wait a minute, this is wrong. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 states, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And yet verses 39 and 40 tells us that one thief had no fear. One thief had no knowledge. In verse 39, it says, then one of the criminals... Were hang, who were hanged, blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. This is not the first time that these words have been repeated. Not even by the crowd. These words have been repeated before. You see, the thief didn't know who this Jesus was. The thief is just following with the crowd. Hey, if you really are who you say you are, come off the cross Save yourself. Oh, by the way, save, save me too. Was this not really the same thing that Satan had hurled at Jesus at the temptation? 
If you are the Christ, prove it right here, right now. Oh, had Christ given in and came off the Christ, come off the cross right then and there, Satan would have won a great victory that day. You say, how so? Christ must die. And he must be raised from the dead in order to receive victory over death. If you and I were on the cross and we had the power to come down after people were taunting and mocking, we would be in the, we would be in the, in the seat of saying, I'll show you. I'll prove to you I am who I say I am. But even if he'd come down, they still would not have believed. Miracle after miracle Christ did, and they would not believe. Oh, what a missed opportunity this thief had. Stretched out there, an arm length away from the Savior, an arm length away from the most powerful being in the universe, and this thief misses his opportunity. Oh, what would you give to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Christ? You say, well, I can do that in prayer. Ah, but face to face, right here, right now. What would you ask him? What would you say to him? The same things that you're saying in prayer. This individual could only say vicious and hateful words because out of the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. And yet, the other thief, he rebuked him. The other thief recalls what Proverbs is talking about. In verse 4 he says, Do you not even fear God seeing you under, under the same condemnation? This thief feared God. Coming to that point in time where there is no way out. The next door that he was to step through was death. And the final judgment of facing God. He feared for the first time in his life, he feared God, and knowledge came to him. He finally understood. It might be sad as we look back and say, does it really take all these hard things in life before an individual finally comes to the Lord? Sometimes. Oh, if he would just have believed earlier in life, perhaps some of these events wouldn't have transpired. But even in a hostile environment, God began to a work in a condemned man. And from this condemned man, we see in verse 41, he says, indeed, we just, we are, and just, we, uh, and we indeed justly, for we receive a due reward for our deed. But this man, he's done nothing. I find it strikingly interesting that as I've read through this passage many times, I've never noticed this before. How is it that the thief knows that Jesus has done nothing wrong? Who told him? Did he have direct revelation? Did God pour out while he was on the cross saying, this Jesus is the Son of God and he's done nothing wrong? How did he know? More importantly, how do you know? Perhaps you say, well, my father's told me or my mother's told me or my, my friends have told me or someone that I really respect has told me. But have the words of Christ spoken to you and told you? You see, the thief was there lying on the ground when Christ's right hand was pierced by a nail and attached to the cross and his left and his legs. And while he was going through the same thing and hearing the surrounding of everybody mocking and jeering and ha 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 and hearing the Roman soldiers because we recall he was up close. He also heard the words of Jesus and Jesus did not say, ouch! Although I'm sure it hurt. The words that are caught and remembered 
are these. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. If they truly understood what they were doing, they would remove the Son of God off the cross, and everybody would get down on their hands and knees and beg for forgiveness and worship him right then and there. And yet, only the thief was given the courage to deny the crowds. And in doing so, he admits to his sin. It takes courage to admit one's sin. Remember in verse 41, he says, we receive justly for what we have done. The reward that we are receiving is because we are robbers. We are murderers. We are trying to start a rebellion. And this is the right punishment for the crime. The thief has no hesitation, no excuses. He doesn't even cast blame upon his fellow com camaraderies, his fellow criminals, and says, you know, they, they coaxed me into this. The thief just admits to his actions and declares that this punishment is just. See, sin's not a mistake. It's not even a weakness. Sin is a rebellion and an insult against God. Didn't Adam and Eve rebel against God when they chose to disobey? Didn't God destroy the earth with a flood because of the wickedness and corruption that was throughout the world? Didn't God wipe out the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because of sin? Yeah. But you might be thinking, that's the Old Testament. That's the old God where it seems like every time someone did something wrong, he punished them. But in the New Testament, God is loving. God does not really punish sin in the New Testament. Remember the husband and wife who came in the doorway, Ananias and Sapphira? All they did was lie. And they were slain. Not by Peter, not by the apostles. They just walked in and said, did such and such happen? No. God killed him right there. The wife walks in. Not a hello. Is such and such true? No. Boom. She's down. And they're carrying her out to the grave. In fact, remember in Corinth? When they were gathering around the communion table. Because some individuals were coming to the communion table in an unworthy manner. Meaning in a manner that was bringing disgrace upon Christ. Paul says, some of you have died because of that. Why is it that we take sin and we look at sin and we play with sin? Why is it that we take sin like Plato and we try to mold it into something that we want? And we say, yeah, it's not so bad. Sin really is not that bad. And yet we look at different passages in Romans chapter 1, in Colossians chapter 3, in Galatians 5, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We see a list of sins. And God says this is not to be a part of the Christian. Put a marker in where you're at in Luke chapter 23. Let's go to 1 Corinthians Chapter 6. In chapter 6, verse 9, Paul says, Do you not know that the unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now you and I might look at those sins and say, they're not all equal. Some sins have greater consequences in this life. Some of them we say, ah, that doesn't seem to be, that's socially acceptable. God calls it sin. We have to be careful that we do not make room in society or in our lives 
for certain sins that God just says, this is not right. Because it's a rebellion against God. It's an insult to who he is. And one, just in one of those lists there that, that I mentioned, I'm sure that you know somebody that fits in that pattern. I know people that fit in this pattern. Sin is to be removed from us. Do not mistake God's long suffering towards you, you and your sin as permissive towards sin. Just because he doesn't punish it right away does not mean that he won't soon. God desires his children to admit to their sin so he can cleanse them softly and gently with his word. The other option is to take a scrub and rub that sin away. When I was first married, of course when you're first married, everything changes. Your wife brings all these strange things into your home. Things that perhaps you've never seen in your life. Well, one of these things was in our bathroom. In the shower. I had never seen this in my life. My bar of soap had dwindled away to, you know, this fits in the small part of your palm and, and soon it just deteriorates and it's gone. And I was out of soap. And I saw this other thing on, and it was sort of like round like a piece of soap. And I grabbed that and I put it under water. And I'm trying to rub it on my hands and there is no lather coming up at all. In fact, I'm thinking, I don't even know what this is. Later, I get out and I ask my wife, there's a rock in our shower. What is this for? It's a pumice stone. I use it on the bottom of my feet to get all the calluses and stuff so I have soft feet. Can you imagine taking that stone and rubbing it on your arms or on your face? If God has to take a pumice stone to us to remove the sin, that will not be joyable. That will be very painful. God would rather us to acknowledge our sins, as he says in 1 John, acknowledge your sins, confess them, and he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. God's desire is to softly say, I'm so thrilled that you acknowledge that. I understand that you are seeing it from my eyes, that it is wrong. Let's put that behind us. Let's not do that no more. In fact, I'm not even going to remind you of that sin. I'm not going to call you out and go, ah, you did it again. Nope. I'm going to put it behind me. Because now you see it from the way I see it. The thief on the cross comes to that point while he's hanging there. I am a sinner. I've done wrong things. You know, it takes courage. Not only to acknowledge our sins, but it takes courage to acknowledge our needs. These five verses expose for us a wealth of truth about ourselves and about our, about our Lord. Our needs seem to shift as regularly as our emotions do. We think what we need can be fulfilled by material things or by physical contact or by substances or whatever. But oftentimes what we discover from God's word, our needs are completely different from what our wants are. And we discover our needs are truly fulfilled in Christ. But it's our wants that are driven by our flesh. And those wants, we think that we can fulfill. We think that we can fulfill the empty spot that's in our heart. Because everybody has an empty spot in their heart. The thief decided he would join a, a crowd. And once he had joined a crowd, a crowd would be able to fulfill his loneliness perhaps. Or make him feel a part of a group. Because we all want to feel accepted. So he began to walk with the wrong crowd. And along the way, he started doing things with his friends. Things that weren't right, but at least he had friends. Soon he was 
participating in petty crimes. And before long, he had joined himself to a group of outlaws. And as outlaws, they began to steal and murder. And he thought to himself, this is so exciting. It's so exciting to do something wrong and to get away with it. What a rush. He felt like he was in control. And for a while, his heart was numbed to the pain of that emptiness that still was there. You and I try many different things to cover up that hole. But there's only one thing that fills that. It's Jesus Christ. He's the only thing that fits perfectly in that emptiness. And it can only be done by the grace of God. At his deathbed, he requests the grace of God. Look down in verse 42. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Isn't it interesting that his prayer does not fit our format when we ask somebody to believe in Jesus? We have a certain format that we like to use. We will say, pray this prayer after me. Do what I do, and then you'll have salvation. The thief just says, <clears throat> Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Was he asking the right thing? Did he, did he have salvation? Well, the answer tells us everything. Jesus' answer in verse 43 shows us the power of God's grace. He says, truly, I'm telling you as plainly as we are on this cross right here and now, today you will be with me in paradise. Sometimes our English text does not bring out the emphaticness of what's being transpired here. Christ is spread out on the cross and so is the other thief beside him. Perhaps he leans over and tilts his head, but he's speaking loud enough to where he can be heard. And the text in the Greek places the emphasis on not being in heaven, but on being with me. He says, with me, today you will be. With me, thief, you will be with me this very day. Where will that be? Oh, we'll be in heaven. But that emptiness that you've been longing for will be filled with a relationship that began as men were dying on the cross. The thief had no opportunity to do any good works. The thief had no opportunity to come down and be baptized. Jesus met him there forgave his sins, and exchanged his ruined life for eternal life. In a short passage like this, there's a few principles that I think need to be brought out. And the first principle for, for us to walk away with, we need to remember that God is able to forgive any sin. God is able to forgive any sin. Abortion, homosexuality, blasphemy, murder, unfaithfulness, gossip, lying. There is no sin that God is not able to forgive. There is no sin that you can do or that you have done that God is not able to forgive. The second thing, God does not require anything from us. There is nothing you and I can do that God needs or wants. God is the one who is giving all to us. He offers us the greatest gift, and we have to decide to take it. Once we take it, we respond in praise and joy and thankfulness. But He doesn't require anything. There's no bargain with God. He just says, I have this for you. Are you willing to receive it? 
The third thing, heaven is a real place. That also means hell is a real place. It's not a metaphor. It's not a way to explain the unknown. Christ speaks of himself being in a real, live place. Like going to San Francisco. That is a real location. And he tells the thief on the cross that you too will be in the same location that I'm going to be. There's no reason for us to wait until our final hour. Because if you wait till your final hour, the pressures of the crowd may overwhelm you. You may not be able to resist. It may be too hard to overcome. Every individual can make their peace with God today. Say, ah, like the thief on the cross, I can choose you. On that cross, or on that hill of Calvary, only one man died. Only one man died. Only one man died in his sins and was separated from God. Because remember, that's what death really is. It's not physical. It means being separated from God for all eternity. A poem that I copied from an old book says this way. Three men shared death on a hill, but only one man died. The other two, a thief and God himself, made rendezvous. Three crosses still are born upon Calvary's hill, where sin still lifts them high. Upon the one, sag broken men who cursing die. Another holds a praying thief or those who penitent as he still find the Christ beside them on the tree. Isn't it wonderful that Christ is willing to come to right where you and I are? And he's willing to reach out and say, I am here. I am willing to forgive you all your sins. I don't require anything of you, but I can save you from your sin. And I can give you what you most desperately need in life. A relationship with me. Now I know in an audience like this, chances are everybody here has believed into Jesus Christ. Ah. Uh, what about your friends? What about your coworkers? That same need that you and I had, they have just as much. May we take the information that we've gathered as we are watching this thief, may it cause us to say, oh, God has mercy on those who do not deserve mercy. And he's willing to give it to you today. May that cause you and I to have the boldness that we need to tell others about this great God that we serve.